<laughs> ah, I see. The broadcast is live. There we go. Okay. Oh, yeah. We're live. <laughs> what <laughs> makes a manuscript sing from the first page and what sour notes turn the readers away? Yeah. With more and more customers judging books based on the look inside sample, your first page is key to making sales. DAW editor Sheila Gilbert joins us to respond to six first pages submitted, oh, seven, seven first pages submitted by Keystroke authors. We'll talk about what works and what doesn't so that we can make our own manuscripts even better. So, ladies and gents, let's get to it. Sheila, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. So, yeah. Much easier than like having to fly somewhere to go to a writer's conference, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, you usually do an activity like this where you're meeting with authors and going over their first pages at writer's conferences. Actually, um, at a writer's conferences, you've got two different things happening. One is the, the, which I don't really like that much, the elevator pitch where you've got all the guests sitting at a long table and then you've got lines of people waiting to come and tell you about their book. And then when they get done with one person, they might move on to another person. So you're talking to somebody about their book, and while you're hearing somebody pitching a book they just pitched to you to the person next to you, which is a little disconcerting. The other thing is uh, you get sent more samples than, you know, like maybe a couple of chapters, uh, and, and you need it, and you have a private discussion for a period of time with the, with the prospective author. But um, and the problem with that sometimes is that uh, what I found is that they just send you a piece of a manuscript, but they don't send you a synopsis or anything. And, and several times I started talking to them all and I'm like, so I'm guessing your book is about this based on what I've got here. And it turns out that's not at all what their book is about. That's just what they were doing in this first chapter. And then the book went somewhere else completely, you know, so uh, I think- the synopses think, are important. <laughs> yes, I, th I think people hate doing synopses, I, you know, um, and, but on the other hand, some kind of a summary to give you an idea of what the story is, is really not a bad idea, you know, um, because if you send the entire manuscript, you know, the odds are, like, we have somebody who reads the slush and, and will read to the point where it's like, no, this isn't going to work for us, or, hey, this one was good, somebody else should look at it, you know, so. Mm. Um, but if you're not going to be doing that, if you're only going to see a partial, it's definitely good to have a, a short synopsis and you know, some kind of a summary uh, so that people know what your book is about. So if you're a slush pile editor and your job is to kind of go through the slush pile and see what manuscripts, dog mm -hmm. books might be interested in, generally about how long does it take you to get a sense of this is a book I want or this one I'll pass on? Well, I think sometimes you can get it within, so, I mean, if something's really bad, you can obviously get it on the first page, but um, if something's kind of interesting, you might read a few chapters, and then if you're really interested, uh, you, you know, you might end up reading the whole manuscript. Uh, some of the things that happen, though, are, some people shouldn't, shouldn't give up hope either, you know. Uh, like, uh, the person who handles the slush pile will send out, you know, you send out kind of stock responses, but it's, but if he thought it was interesting but didn't quite work for us, he might say to the person, you know, do you have anything else? Or you might want to work on this some more and resubmit it, you know, and, and those are actually real comments, not just, you know, a brush off kind of thing. So I think part of it is for, for somebody who wants to be more with kind of navigating the responses they get. <laughs> so to see where where they might want to follow up and where it's like, oh, this person actually really rejected me. They don't sound like they really want to see anything before. So, uh, you know. Have you yeah. had any of those authors take feedback back from you, you know, in a manuscript that got you rejected, um, but take that feedback, fix the manuscript, come back to DAW, and eventually get accepted? Have you seen that um, happen? It, it happens occasionally. Um, uh, like one story, which didn't exactly come from the slush pile, but I, I think I was telling you about Lauren, but um, so there was a prospective author who went to various conventions and went to conventions that I was at. And it was one convention where I was the editor guest. They had, I don't know how many people um, pitching their ideas to me. And, and you know, there must have been, I don't know, 40 people and everybody had five minutes, although some people obviously pushed that a little bit, you know. And so um, this, this prospective author came up and, and he pitched this idea to me. And I said, okay, well, that sounds interesting, you know, when you have something, you know, when you see it. And so over actually a period of years, um, he would, you know, he finished the manuscript, he sent it to me, and it's like, okay, well, here's the problems I'm having. 
you know, but it, but it was interesting enough that I was willing to keep looking at it. And so over a period of years, he would send me a revised manuscript. And because I was so backed up, I wouldn't obviously immediately read his manuscript. But if I knew that I was going to be seeing him at a convention soon, I was like, well, I have to read this before I see him so we can talk about it. And eventually after, I'm not sure how long, but it might have been five or six years, um, he sent me the manuscript, I read it, and we went to discuss it. Um, we were at this hotel where the restaurant was closed for the part of the time, so it was a great place to sit down, and peace and quiet and talk to somebody. And I said to him, and he, and he was waiting to find out the next things that were wrong with it, right? So I said to him, well, you know, I think I'm gonna buy your manuscript. We still need to do things and we need to talk about it, but it's definitely in, in good enough shape that I feel confident about buying it. And he was like totally shocked. And, and he, then he said to me, you see those people down there that are kind of looking up at us? I said, yes. He said, well, that's my writing group. I said, well, do you want to tell them that I'm going to buy your manuscript? And he said, no, I really want to tell my wife. I said, well, do you want to call your wife? And he said, yes, but I want to go back to my room because I'm afraid I might cry. Oh. <laughs> so, so sweet, right? And, and then when he called his wife, she was actually in a meeting. And she said, oh, I have to take this call. But she knew he was meeting with me. And then she came back and she told them that, you know, I was buying his book. And their reaction was, you're not going to quit your job, are you? <laughs> no, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so, because the other thing I think the authors have to learn is that, you know, for every author that's like a bestseller, you know, right out of the first book, uh, that's not the case generally. And it's, you know, uh, especially these days, it's definitely harder these days, you know, as, as the account has diminished you know, uh, and with, with the whole COVID situation. Uh, so some of it requires patience and some of it is, you know, hopefully you're gradually building an audience for your series or just for your writing, you know, uh, and you have to kind of go along with it, which is why we encourage no one to quit a job when they sell them. And perseverance, man. I mean, that five, six years and he's just like, oh, make this thing. I'm determined. Right, right. I, I love that. You know, like some people are just like, put it out, see if it sticks, write the next story also a good model right. you get better with each story you write yeah. but also that perseverance man in both ways it's not really kicking off so you write another story you're determined to make this one stick um never give up never surrender yeah and that also is one to put a time and he's now written two series for me so and he's you know working on like the third book in the second series so um so yes perseverance ta talent but also perseverance, you know, is definitely something that I think people, if they really want to write, they, they have to persist. Gerald yeah. Brandt in the audience says his fourth book is coming out from DAW next week. Yes, indeed it is. So, uh, and I already have the follow-up book, which is unusual. It's, it's, it's really nice to be able to read, you know, several books in a series at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she's actually read it and giving me a quote for it. Um, so uh, being able to read more than one book at a time is great because, you know, whatever you establish in that first book in a series, you're going to have to live with it. And mm -hmm. and sometimes that's really hard because when you get further on in the series, there's all these things you would have done, but now you can't because you've already set up your universe and you have to abide by it, you know. Yep. So the first book is really important that you get everything down the way you want that universe to be and, and where you put it to go. But so having two books to read is great because then, you know, based on the first book and have and having it fresh in my mind, I could go into the second book, you know, and, and it was just as if I was continuing. So, so do you are you saying have two books in a series ready to go? No, to no, no I'm not saying that at all because most people don't. It just happened that, that this is the way it worked out, you know. It mm. doesn't often work out that way. You know, so. uh. I mean, I guess if somebody's been writing for years but hasn't actually sold anything, they could have, I don't know, they could have four, five, six books in a series, you know, which could be problematic because if there's a lot of problems with the first book, then, you know, you're probably going to end up having to scrap everything else, you know, mm -hmm. when you do that first book. So. Well, James says he's here taking notes. So we have a question about first pages. As an editor, what do you look for in that first page? Well, uh, I think one of the important things is characters, because I think that's one of the things that drives all books. If you, if you don't have characters that the readers can get invested in, then you're not going to go anywhere. With your book. I agree. So, Absolutely. So I think when you open, like, in fact, that kind of leads to the first 
page of our first submission uh, because it reads more like um, a little history and kind of an info dump than it does like something that's going to grab you because it, it talks about uh, uh, it's it follows um, the time of Alexander the Third and General oh. that he had. Right. So really quick, yeah, this one is from, can we say the names? Yes, yes, okay. so Yeah, so this one's coming from J. Clifton Slater. Caveat, this is the first sentence out of number 15 in his series. So this is the 15th book. People here know a lot of things. So I don't, I don't know if you realize that, but to me, that, that does definitely take into account like a first page as well. This is number 15. People know a lot of stuff that's going on, but I do love what you're saying. Because the first sentence is, when asked by his generals who would succeed him, Alexander III of Macedonia replied from his deathbed, Kratoros. I, I I love that first sentence. I'm like, ooh, deathbed, right out of the gate, dang. Right, but then it goes into this whole thing of all of these generals, and of course, Kratoros. Yep. Uh, right where I was going. Right, he's dead. So, <laughs> and they don't actually know why he said that. They're making assumptions about why he said that. But it, it reads like a historical sum, summary rather than that you're invested in any of these three generals, you know. Uh, and I think that's definitely a problem. I, and frankly, if it's the 15th book, I'm actually surprised, you know, because I, why would you necessarily need all of this if it's the 15th book? That is also a good point. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, it does say more story, so I wasn't paying attention to that, you know, when I when I looked at it. And I just assumed it was the first book, and the person was giving us this whole info dump back setting, you know. Um, but if it's the 15th book, first of all, we should have specific characters that have been building over the course of the series. And if any of these characters fit that bill, I can't tell it from the stage. You know, so. Yeah, because right after that first sentence, there's four character names I'm not even going to try to pronounce mm -hmm. that are puzzled. Uh, we're puzzled at the response. Right. Yeah. The Can we actually hear that paragraph? I'd like oh, to hear yeah. a little bit of this. Okay. I'm going to attempt the names. Yes. Here we go. Generals mm -hmm. Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, Antigonus, and Seleucus were puzzled at the response. Although the physically strongest of Alexandra's commanders Kratoros was not in Babylon commanding an army. General Kratoros, Kratoros resided in Cilicia <laughs> while building a fleet. And the successor to Alexander the Great needed cadres of, oh, these words, <laughs> hoplites, cavalrymen, archers, spearmen, and slingers. In light of Kratoros' lack of phalanxes, the general deciphered the answer to mean the strongest general would succeed the Macedonian king. 66 years after his death, the territories conquered by Alexander were controlled by the descendants of three of his toughest generals. The other three, including Kratoros, were dead. I see what you're saying. So I'm actually, I'm sorry, Jay Cliff, I love you. I love you so much. You are the best. You always say the nicest things, but I'm being thrown out, like kind of like what Sheila was saying. I've been thrown some names lots of history and then at the very end we get to like the juice but i don't know what it means exactly you just know that they they've come to blows over a period of time you know, so uh and frankly uh you know he's saying that this dead now dead uh, general is the strongest general and then he's he's re they're redefining everything it's like well he doesn't have anything that you need to run an army. So how is he just one as general? Because you're not your your strength is really based on your you know your troops, not um, just on your character. So, uh, and, so I and, think oh, okay. yeah, go ahead. I think we're trying to set the stage here for the novel. We're trying to establish what's going on um, in the history what the reader needs to know for the, the plot to begin, for the action, the conflict to happen. Is there another way to yes, show I, that, to set I the think, stage? Yeah. I think you should start with whoever the main character is, because we have no idea from this page who the main character is. And I'm assuming there is a main character, you know, or, if, or even if there's three or four, we need, to, we need to know that. So it'd be much better to start with that character 
in some sort of action, in some sort of setting. And then instead of info dumping all of the stuff up front with all of the names and, and you know, which slowed you down immediately, um, <laughs> you would gradually over the course of the book get the information, whatever whatever information was actually important to the reader. I mean, and I think that's the problem that a lot of writers have is they, you know, they're creating this universe, this world, and it's very important to them and they get into all the details and then they have to tell you about it. Whereas they should really more be showing you about it. You know, you, you, you should have the characters living in it and we gather what the world is from their experiences, of it, you know, rather than being told specifically, you know, this is what it is. It's this kind of a world and it's a, it's always at war. And this character is a general, or, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. That's not nearly as interesting as seeing somebody plunged into the midst of some kind of action or interaction with another important character. You know? So, to to go off of that my suggestion to you jay cliff um i i still love that opening sentence because you know from his deathbed and he's naming this person i'm like dude this bouts to be epic and then i'm like names jay cliff these names so but if we get some dialogue in here and they're just like yes insert important information of stuff because i'm awesome description of some things around the room person's dying he's like ah you know get we get that action in there with the tension of that death happening and we know all of this history based on how you know these three four people are interacting with each other as this general is dying unless that was a past incident then i would have to dig deeper but if this is a current incident then yes yeah I, and i think from this first page it is a past incident because it's the descendants of those generals that mm -hmm. i think the story is about you know jumping mm -hmm. from this page so um then yeah some kind of combo about this thing to introduce all this stuff right and if, and if there's like three three or four main characters and there's all this tension between them and all all these battles and interactions then you might be better off starting there you know and, and just grabbing people and then you can gradually introduce the past history. Yes. Um, yeah. What, she, what Sheila said, that's what I was getting at. <laughs> Julie Zernita, she suggests having someone eavesdropping, holding onto a ledge with their <laughs> failing fingers. Okay, you've got some conflict, someone's about to die. Um, we have the this conflict of generals, descendants of the generals who are ruling the territories, but they weren't necessarily the ones who led the charge. You know, Alexander, right. Yeah, Alexander the Great was the one who kind of took over these uh, territories and now people later who who didn't earn them are the ones who are ruling them. Right. So how does that create conflict? If you can find a single incident with a limited number of characters that the reader can really connect with to show how this is a problem, uh, a real problem, and, and then hook us from there. Yeah, I mean, they could have sent to... some, you know, a small group to spy on the other kingdom preparatory to some kind of battle. Um, which would certainly be more gripping. Yeah. And before we move on, I do want to, uh, Corey Gillum, does anyone else while reading a book with difficult names assign simple altern <laughs> alternative names just so you can keep your reading flow? Yes. Every single one of them's names, I'm just gonna tell you, uh, Cassander, that one's not very difficult. I can do that one. Cassander, the he, Lis I don't know, Lissy, uh, this guy would be Pedo. And then Auntie, and then we got some, we got Sully. Uh, <laughs> that's what my brain would be doing as I'm reading. Anyway, I yeah, just had to that's the other thing about things like that—they just slow you down. You know, so. Yeah, it's it's something to think about uh, as an author uh, picking names. But I do want to say that like it's genre specific. We had also, uh, yep. Leo. Leo said he he loves this is a classical history, military history book. He loves the classical history that's coming into it. So, to, you know, know your readers. Some readers love these kinds of the real authentic names, Ptolemy, um, Alexander, but I'm not saying they're wrong. I mean, I, I love a challenge. I want to know how to say them. And but you do love our challenges. If, yeah. yeah, if I'm just like fast reading, then. Yeah, but, the, but it is <laughs> it's, it's historical, so it has to use, I mean, the person has to use the actual names because it's obviously based on historical incidents. History, yeah. All right, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay, for submitting. Yeah. Jay Cliff. Okay, next, next, we have R. Max Tilsley's Attrition. 
And um, Kayleen, you want to just read read some of this for us? Yes. So I'll read I'll read that first sentence and then the first paragraph, and then we'll dig in. All right. <clears throat> ah, hitting things. All right. This duty must end. My queen, have I not served with muscle, heart, and patience? No answer greeted May's silent plea as she scraped the sole of her boot on a thick root. Bracken and nettles hid the movement, a green tapestry covering the floor of the small, nameless forest. Dung or mud, either way. It was of little concern to the experienced shields will, shield sworn. Her trouble ran much deeper. So this person, we started off with a really full description of where we are. And uh, then going down, uh, she talks about uh, this, the, uh, this person that she's obviously assigned to take care of and mentor, and she's not too happy about it. Um, so that could be a very interesting premise, depending on where she goes with it, because she obviously wants to be with the rest of the shield sworn, fighting in battle and winning, winning glory. And instead, she's kind of babysitting like a, an apprentice. You know? um, so it's hard to tell. We, we don't know where she's going to go with the story, but obviously, uh, I would imagine that the two of them are going to get into all kinds of problems as, as they you know, uh, travel along. And I don't know if she's getting if they're getting some kind of assignment that will take them places. I mean, I would assume that maybe they are. Um, so, so this at least um, starts us off with characters, with the main character, who we can get a pretty good take on from the first page, which is good, and some description of place, you know, and and. Um, We'll obviously eventually find out more about the character which is kind of saddled with and, and what what their mission of the help them is. So um, I would say this one starts off pretty well, um, and you know where where it goes from there will depend on uh, you know how much interest I would actually have in it. But um, but it definitely gives us character, place, you know, and the knowledge that things are not going the way this character would like them to. So. Yeah, so introduce that character, introduce setting, and then start, you know, hinting at that conflict right from the very start. Uh, yeah. Can we hear a little more, Kayleen? Yeah, absolutely. I think I have our sight. Ahead and to her left, Stuart's curly blonde hair disappeared behind thick trunks. But is, I'm still reading the same one, right? <laughs> <laughs> but his smooth voice served as a beacon. Told you I would be the one. But I am fated to have my brilliance ignored. Except by yourself, of course. Another voice called out. He so, hadn't. Even, oh, so we already see the problem with this character. <laughs> yeah, he, he thinks very well of himself, but obviously he's very inexperienced. Um, and his friends let him know it, exactly. and they let him hear about it. You've got humor right from the beginning. I love that. Yeah, and you know you've got sort of a little more realistic character interaction. Here, so. And this this is definitely a way to bring in. Um, things that you don't end up having to tell the reader, like this person is this way, this is what she saw, this da da da, da. because you're hearing those descriptions simply by experiencing them through the dialogue. And through that dialogue, he hadn't even reached a score of springs. And if he didn't control his tongue, he'd likely never do so. Selecting him had almost been a favor. Now we're also simultaneously getting direct information about the current problem that these these people are going through they're going somewhere they're headed through this forest and if they don't stop bickering at each other and chatting they might die so right. we also have a little bit of tension so that's that's a good weave right there yeah so i think i think that's pretty much covers that one <laughs> all right and before we head on to kenneth brits I am going to segue wonderfully into Spotlight. Today's Spotlight is on Megastructures, Moe's 5.5 Anthology, edited by Yuda Honjaya Wujuretne. Oh, love it when I can say it right. Few artists thrive in solitude, and nothing more is more stimulating than the conflict of minds with similar interests, wrote the celebrated science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke. In these pages, a spectacular collection of science fiction authors newcomers and veterans, bestsellers and debuts, clash thusly over one of Clark's most famous motifs. Ah, oh, I could talk motifs. Extreme feats of engineering. But wait, there's more. Moe's 5.5 hard sci-fi anthology is coming out with another. 
Mars, Mose, 5.5, Volume 2. Sending probes and rovers is one thing. One day, mankind will have to go to Mars. Here are their stories. Through robotic explore, though robotic explorers have vastly increased our knowledge about the Red Planet, there's still so much we don't know. Will Mars be a second home for humanity, or will it usher in our destruction? Nine hard sci-fi sci fiction writers take on the big questions in this groundbreaking anthology, which grapples with real-life scientific puzzles and dilemmas in the format of thrilling short stories. Mose 5.5 stands for scientific rigor, and Mars stands for non-stop excitement. Explore the fourth planet from the sun in the coming in the company of authors such as Peter Codron, Daniel Do Oh, I should have practiced Daniel Dominguez, Ralph Kern, Simone Morgan, Bill Patterson, Felix R. Savage, and Kayleen Williams. Plus a forward by YouTube, what the maths? Anton Petrov. Pre-order your copy in the link that just dropped. Thank you. And Doom. <laughs> Very dramatic. <laughs> Thank you. I try. I try. I have to say the Mars one is going to be a little more difficult because we're getting so much information now that they're going to have to deal with. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's but they freaking science the heck out of that stuff. Um, I know from experience. It's good times though. Okay. And, and I right. you know, we're talking about a Mars mission, so you know, sometime in the next ten or fifteen years, you know, what's fiction in here may become more of a reality. All right, and I'm going to segue one little thing because the people in the chat will not let me wait till the end of the show. <laughs> so here we go, really, really quick. And this is for you, Lauren. You know what's coming. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Lauren. Happy birthday to you. Oh, wow, Kayleen. Okay. That was really good. That was good for you. Super wow, awesome. awesome. Yeah, you know. And we got you to sing on the show. Yeah, there you go. We need to get more of that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thanks, everyone. Everyone made Hopefully, my everyone out really there special. sung along with me. Yay, birthday! <laughs> Okay, so we were trying really hard to get through as many as these we tongue tied as many of these as we can. Yeah. All right, so Kenneth Brits, you're up next. He doesn't appear to have a title. <laughs> <laughs> All right, your digital world is your life. The world spun out of focus, but her eyes locked onto those word words crudely carved into the bottom of the wooden table Bianca lay under. Okay, can I just say right now, I'm hooked already. <laughs> was that all life was anymore? Just a bunch of ones and zeros marching from birth to death? Bullshit, she whispered, throwing her arm over her eyes and shutting the words out. Their after image remained etched on, into her eyelids, and the world spun even more. Mindy nudged Bianca with her foot. The noobs are here. F off, Bianca replied. She'd gotten drunk, really drunk, which was an accomplishment. I'll drink to that, Mindy replied with a small burp. Yes, this thing is dripping with character. Sheeta, what are your thoughts? <laughs> and, and with drink as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> so we know right away that we've got a, uh, ironically, I mean, the way it starts, we know we've got science fiction, but then when you get further down, it's uh, veering more towards fantasy gaming, so um, it's a little hard to tell exactly where this is going to go. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously, um, they're not just gamers because uh, they uh, they understand what they're reading off the bottom of the table. <laughs> so, um, so uh, it, I mean, it it doesn't give you it gives you something of these two characters. Um, and then somebody else showing up and and uh then you know and kicking kicking bianca who's under the table and so uh and and it ends very it ends with so should be ready when we go so obviously this is a group of people that are going on some kind of a mission together whether it's real world or relates to some kind of gaming thing is not clear but i am sure there's going to be some kind of gaming element in it 
and we wouldn't have had this on the first page. Um, so it, it does it, it does give you a sense of place. It does give you a sense of the relationship of these two characters to one another. Uh, and, and then it just introduces um, the setting that presumably is going to take them off on the adventure. So, mm. Yeah, yes, that is a really good first one too. You told me about that. Yeah, I, 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 this one, this one definitely leaves you. I'm just like, why is there not a second page? Which <laughs> is a good sign. Right, that is a good sign. Yeah, so, yeah. What I liked about it is I was asking questions right away and not like, I'm confused questions, questions like, why is she under a table? Why is she under a table? Why would anyone carve your digital world as your life, you know, under a table? And now she's seeing that. Why would she immediately call it bullshit? Oh, that's a bad word. <laughs> why? Why? I want, I need to know. Like, there's mysteries here. And I under, you know, I, I understand what the paragraph is saying. I understand what the characters are saying. I'm not unclear about that. But I can also understand there's a mystery going on, and I want to know what the answer is right from the beginning. So, yeah, because that line is obviously going to have some meaning throughout like the story, or, or it wouldn't have been that. So. Is that something you try to encourage in, in authors when they get you a manuscript? Like, if, if you see a first page that you're like, hmm, I'm just not hooked by that, like, how do you get an author to kind of think about their story and think about a moment where? you could introduce that mystery or introduce the conflict? Like, well, how do you get them to that point? I, well, I think, you know, if you're really on the first page, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, because we get way too many submissions. Oh, yeah. You mention all the things that we have bought and have to work on with authors, because you don't just buy something and publish it, you know. Uh, we work on, on revisions together, you know, and then uh, and doing line edits. And so there's a lot involved in every book that comes out. You know? Um, so if, if, uh, if somebody submits something and the first page really doesn't grab you, uh, then it's really not worth pursuing it. Mm. So. Yeah. So, okay. So if, if you're an author and you're thinking about submitting that first page, it's, it's very important. And, and, you know, at least if you have something, even if it doesn't really totally work, but if you have something that's kind of interesting, like mm -hmm. the first line is interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and where the author goes with it. Like if I read two chapters and I find that it's disjointed or whatever, but at least they're still carrying through that, that mystery, then I'll probably read further and, and discuss the problems with it. So, right, so is this one that you'd keep going with, keep reading with? I might, you know, I'd, I'd have to look at a few more pages to decide because, you know, uh, it, it only tells you, obviously the next, Several pages are going to tell you more about what's going on with these people and where, where they're going. And what they're going to. So I would but <laughs> you seem interested in wanting to read them, so that's definitely a good sign. Yeah. So you know, when you're when you're writing, yeah, definitely that first page you want. You know, de also depending on the genre, but definitely that getting the reader to be like, "Ooh, what's that about? Ooh, I can't wait to see where this goes." And it might not even have anything to do with the first chapter but just like that character saying something that vague first like doomsday etching underneath the table it it gets those questions already burning inside the reader's mind to want to delve deep to to go on that journey and figure them out so definitely something i think is is important to have on that first page is yeah you definitely want to you definitely want to grab them with so they, they have some idea of the story concept, you know, mm -hmm. um, but again, I brought to them through the characters, not as a wondering list of things. You know? Yeah, and this and this was fun. I mean, they're both drunk. She's under a table. They're waiting for people to come in, and we're also getting a little bit of a sense of, of why they're there. And yeah. yeah, that's just that's just fun. And you also yeah. have to say if you're about to go off on a mission with these people, being, being recovering from being drunk and having terrible hangovers, so this was the best way to start it. Yeah. So, yeah. so which, that's gonna... again, they knew they were doing this, so well, what were they celebrating? What, what did they get drunk over? Since, since obviously it doesn't sound like they're alcoholics from, from this page. So. All right. So, oh my gosh, and I already scrolled down to the next one. Up, 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 up. All right, Kenneth, good job, man. <laughs> Clap that out. Digital world life. 
See Stephen Manley. You're up to plate. Think of a title for your book, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we didn't have a title for that one, so it's just uh, with you. Dream of the First Night. Oh, yeah, that's the next one. Yeah. So. There we go. All right. So, see Stephen, Dream of the First Night, and this one with a K. Mm. The night died a few seconds before the doppelganger's cell phone started ringing. The creature relaxed the appendages that were currently serving as its arms, allowing the knight's corpse to slide from them with a slow, sucking whisper. A, soul, a slow, sucking whisper. There we go. It flicked away blood as the appendages twisted and wreathed into something more closely resembled. Into yeah, something more closely <laughs> resembling human hands. Fix that, Steven. The knight's face that it wore twisted away as well, returning to the bland, everyman features that it preferred. So this is kind of interesting because you, you're getting this setup of this this creature that's obviously not human, uh, but that can transform itself into any particular humor because obviously it had transformed itself into the knight. Yeah. Uh, and obviously it also seems to be a real blood sucker. So, so I, there's almost a little bit of a vampiric element, though I suspect that's not what this character is. Uh, and, and the contrast between the knife and then the doppelganger answering the cell phone is kind of interesting also, because you, you've got two things out of time with them, and they're just not in the sync. So, um, so, so that opening part is, is certainly interesting, you know. Uh, where he goes from there, I don't know. Because obviously, even though it, it would seem like um, kind of a bit more like science fiction um, with the phone and everything else, but then you're dealing with a queen and a scroll, which sounds far more fantasy. So yeah. I suppose, um, Mr. Chuck, Chuck Manley, he, uh, he writes a lot of urban, paranormal, fantasy uh -huh. so, okay so that would make sense yeah so this yeah this is definitely fitting in there um the next yeah, one he's, he's blending the the medieval the medieval tropes and ideas you've got the the knight the doppelganger and also you know the cell phone right from the first the first sentence so i'm i'm, I'm excited because i want to hear you know what's his take on urban fantasy going to be and then the next paragraph describes his transformation and it's you know kind of gory and kind of gross and, and i'm excited to see uh, where he's going to take it also i like he, the bland everyman features yeah, that I, it preferred. I, I, yeah I like that it's every like, man reminds me of the morality morality play right, from right. from the middle ages and i don't know if Papa Chuck meant to do that. He kind of, he, he's not crazy about when the English teacher pops in and finds illusions that, that maybe the author did not intend. But right. I do love those illusions and I'm, so it makes me happy and excited that it's in there. And, and I think that, I, I'm not sure that that was what he intended either. I think it was more the idea of this doppelganger. Yeah. As a doppelganger has no specific features, you know, like it's not like if you took a picture of him at age, Ten, you see something specific because obviously he's born this way, and so what he becomes is based on what surrounds him and what his missions are. Yeah, he's the guy everyone's seen before. Everyone knows he just kind of blends in. And what happens next, Kayleen? All right, what happens next is right. find it, find it. The phone continued as it's all oh, I can talk anymore. The phone continued <laughs> its electronic pulse and buzz. The sound grated across the doppelganger's senses as it flicked a bit of gore from its newly formed digits before pulling the device from its coat pocket. He, or it, he, or it yeah. preferred the male form, tapped at the button that would open the connection. He hesitated in speaking, though, as the motel room was suddenly filled with the glow of headlights filtered through the room's worn curtains. It's a little awkward of a sentence there. Yeah. The darkness returned after a moment. Satisfied that the car had nothing to do with him, the doppelganger raised the phone to his ear and said, Yes. Janice. A man's voice said, That you? Is it done? Ew. Now we're really getting some juices. Mm -hmm. Did you want did you want me to do so, <laughs> well, kind of like the whole book. Well, we just, okay, it's only like four more lines, okay. The voice belonged to one of the queen's more arrogant human servants. And Janice took some small pleasure in making the man wait for a response. Hello? 
the human said after almost a minute. You still there? It's done, Janice whispered in a voice as cold. Oh, oh, wait, no, let me redo that. <laughs> it's done, Janice whispered in a voice as cold as a winter wind. I'll have to work on that. And the scroll, <laughs> do you have it? What scroll? I want to know about this scroll. Right, so so you've been sent on a mission to kill some, to kill this knight and get the scroll that the knight has, which may be something they're just trying to get, or maybe something he's stolen from the queen and they're getting back. So, but obviously the doppelganger has very strong opinions about uh, the queen and her people as well. So, and also obviously because he's something very special, he can get away with with you know rejecting somebody's chain. So, mm. he's like the special hired hand. You know, he's like the one that's like we're going to send out Janice. No. Not that one. Yes, that one. Send him. And then it's just like epicness abounds. Yeah. And, I, and I think, you know, obviously the scrolls, as we know, in fantasy are very important. You know, mm -hmm. it, could, it could be uh, information. It could be a magic spell. It could be almost anything. So, uh, and obviously it's very important to the queen. So, Jul Julie says she really liked the, the phone, and I totally agree. Right from the first line, there's that phone, you know, in the night. Right, the and it's a little hand. context to whatever's going on. Yeah. That and then the fact that he's in an old, you know, a, a worn down motel room, and the fact that the car lights stop him. So obviously he's used to pursuit. He's used to being pursued. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or, or he wouldn't pay any attention to that. Yeah. So. I have to say, Papa Chuck, man, from beginning, to the end of that first page, you gave us character, you gave us some mystery, tension, we've got personality coming through there. We also have story problem, dude face. All right, <laughs> had to clap. All right, shall we move on? Cause yeah. like, that, was, that was a really good one. All right, Leo Vaccaro, Children of Rome. So the beginning is like a quote, I'm gonna skip that cause that's not really so much part of the story. I'm going to get into the meat of, or sh I'll just read it. The Roman sh soul shall not perish, but shall tread upon the world through the familiarium. I hope I said that right. First Dominus of Domus Sincio, 61 AD. Over the Baja of Mexico, March 2018. Marcus shivered, not just from the frigid air of the plane's cargo hold. It wasn't just the Okay, yeah, so <laughs> it wasn't just the high altitude jump. That was the fun part. It was everything else that could go wrong. His four counterparts were well into battle trance, and he couldn't even get into the starting point. Uncomfortable and cold, he was packed into the side of the plane's cargo bay like wadded paper, if only to secure the cargo serving as cover for his team's insurrection. He was That's sure it was no accident. accident there was no heat and little room to move. Insertion. Insurrection. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> well, frankly, considering the circumstances there, an insurrection might not have been a bad idea. So, <laughs> so this one's obviously um, current day, but that quote leads us to, the quote introduces us to the familiarium which is apparently the organization that our character belongs to. Uh, and obviously there's, he says there's a bloodless clue between the text and tradesmen of the familiarium, uh, which is not an easy word and you might consider changing it. So, uh, and, and so, you know, what we know is that he's, our character is a warrior, not a tech. That's what we know at the end of this page. And we also know that they're not allowed, and this is a little confusing, they're not, they're, uh, they weren't to use the word soldier for themselves, that honor was reserved only for those who enlisted in the host nation's militaries. And that I find, that little bit I find a bit confusing. So, um, because does that mean they're not in the familiarium or they're being kind of rented out to these countries? So, you know. And actually, they're, actually, it's they're, they're, they're enlisting, so that doesn't mm -hmm. feel like they are being that. So, uh, you know, he's he's kind of set up a little sort of action thing, like they're obviously about to plummet to whatever this mission is. Um, 
but he's also kind of giving us this confusion of, of what this organization actually is. Other than that we know it's obviously agents since it's referred to in 61 AD at that point. So I, I think this is this is a case of um, maybe he's giving us some of this information a little too soon. Mm. We should be concentrating on the mission and maybe what we should see is them actually doing the jump you know, and, and, and then things will go on from there. And he, and he can gradually explain the familiar. And also we'll, we'll see that he's a soldier and presumably he's going to run into some of the, the techs uh, who are going to provide them with their equipment and whatever else. And so uh, I think that, that might be a better way to go with this one than to, than to just hit us up with the confusion of the familiarity. Uh, yeah, going off of what uh, uh, Sheila was saying, the very, so there's, <clears throat> the third paragraph is talking about you know they've been stuffed into this thing by the by in the cargo bay with all the pieces of everything by the loadmaster and he probably did it on purpose and then immediately immediately it goes into the bloodless feud between the texan tradesmen of the familiarum was truly ancient almost as old as the family i'm calling it the family itself the text the craftsmen engineers and technical experts always sought ways to harass the tradesmen the name, the fam, I'm going to try really hard, familiarum gave its warriors. No familiarum was permitted to use the word soldier for themselves. That honor was, was reserved only for those who enlisted within their host nation's militaries. So it, like right at the end, we're just like this great setup of character, of story, immediate story problem. And then we have this huge chunk of um like info dump of mm -hmm. here's the world of that they live within right. when, also tradesman is a very good name for soldier because it doesn't sound like that at all you know it sounds like a merchant <laughs> so, mm. so i think i would you know i would use something different like the, and the text seems to cover a lot of things but at least mostly it's you know engineers and technical experts so that makes some kind of sense we have no idea why they would har harass the tradesmen, you know, what, what, the, what the interaction is between these two groups. And so, so that's just kind of thrown out there. Yeah. Well, you can imagine what's going to happen next in the story, right? They're going to do their jump. And that's, for me, who's terrified of heights, that, that could be really exciting, mm -hmm. exhilarating, right. terrifying, you know, whatever's going to happen. And then they're going on their mission. And, you know, people might die on their mission. Yeah. You know, they might die on their mission. Um, so in the pages that come, we're going to get some really exciting moments. One piece of advice I've heard from editors at different writers' conferences is, well, if your story gets exciting on page eight, why do you have page one through seven? Mm -hmm. And for some manuscripts that's a good question you know maybe those first seven pages aren't needed maybe we can just kind of start on page eight where it gets exciting and kind of go from there and allow some of this information to come out naturally as as it kind of un the story unfolds now i'm not saying that's necessary that's true and the best thing for every author and every manuscript at all but for some stories it might work so it could be something to think about. Especially if they're more action stories, you know, because yeah. you start off dumping all this information and that's not, you don't know that you're there, that, you know, on page eight or nine that something going to turn into an action story. We, we can show some of that through the character interactions and we can allow right. it to come, come out naturally. Right actually. at the beginning, then you kind of know what sort of book you're getting into and you can still get all this information. I mean, even a loadmaster is an, is an odd name because it's like, so what is he? He's obviously not a warrior, so does that mean the loadmaster who just loads the cargo is a tech? You know? so, so obviously there's probably more categories that have to show him. Categories, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of, kind of with the first one, in this first page, we are given a lot of information. We've got the, the main character, we have the place that he's at, we have a brief history of the, you know, Thing that he's a part of. Um, we have more information sort of on the war that's been happening, but we don't really know why, why or who, which please don't put that in here right here. Um, but it's just, there's there's a lot of, of information like coming out all at once when it was a really strong opening. It just it just slid into info like, oh, wait, no, the reader's going to need to know this for future. Yeah, no, instead what they should have done is jumped. <laughs> is, yeah, at this point, um, 
uh, let's see, Loadmaster had stuffed every piece of crap he could find into the cargo bay just to make his team miserable. I want more about that character. I don't care about the Bloodless Feud or any of this other stuff right now. I want to know about the misery he's going through and the jump. Yeah, exactly. And, right. and, and that's what we should get to on the first page. We shouldn't know that they're going to jump, but we should actually see them jump. Because you know? yeah, then they're going to jump down into whatever the story is. So. Yeah. But she was like, yeah. <laughs> Fictional jumping is the way I will jump. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, no, jumping, I I don't quite see that as something I want to do. Like, I've gone up in a hot air balloon, and that was a lot of fun, but. Jumping out of a plane and, you know, uh, hoping a parachute opens, that's not exactly how I'm this. All right, so we've got, what, two more? Two more. Can we do it? Oh my Let's goodness! Do it. Maybe, do it. Maybe we right. can do that late one in. So. Stanley Fu, First Interstellar War. On September 1st, 2099, the Applied Physics Lab at the Great in the point L5 between the Earth and the Moon initiated the first faster than light travel by transporting a particle of matter by means of tachyon pulse. This was rapidly followed by ex experiments in the research facilities everywhere on Earth and off, leading to a growing body of evidence that faster than light FTL travel was not only possible but feasible. Around the same time, Carl where where Warm, warm, warm K, warm, 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 to create artificial gravity. Yeah, I think we're just getting uh, too much tech information here. Uh, and, and it's also not, it's not even clear if he's going to be our main character, because it just seems like he's just another science in progress uh, that, we're, that we're seeing here, because then it goes on to this corporation, uh, and then he starts in uh, transmutation. So, uh, so it's, it seems like, okay, let me think of all the science things that I can have that I need to use in a book, and I'm going to put them here. Um, so I, I think I think this is like really totally an intro yeah. then. And, and the title is The Road to War. So meanwhile, we're talking about fast the light travel and anti-gravity and artificial gravity, none of which seem particularly related to this title. <laughs> It reminds me of like classical science fiction, like Larry Niven and Isaac Asimov. Um, I've got a Larry Niven. I've got Ringworld around here somewhere. That's what I'm looking for. And it I, it reminds me strongly of um, the opening paragraphs in um, Ringworld. Right. Just that I don't think they would science... them nearly as much as this is. You know, it's like um, you know, I don't. I don't think we need to need to get all of this stuff here. So. And also, I'm so curious, is he, is this Crackpot the main character? Or, yeah, I am too. The only character on this page, you know, so. Yeah, honestly, like, Carl Wormke, known all through his life as a Crackpot, finally realized his vision of anti-gravity. Make that your first sentence. Yeah. And then put us in a situation where we are experiencing the applied physics lab and, you know, they're studying this L5 you know, and they are currently initiating this thing, you know, whatever that most important bit is, um, you know, that's that's what we want to know to get into Carl's head. And you know, he our character. we don't actually know that. <laughs> well, this is true. This is true. But this is the only character we have. He, he is the only character we have, yes, exactly. But if Carl, I'm assuming Carl, because he's the only one named, yeah. um, I'm assuming that's the, the main character, you know, but I, I really like that sentence make that first you know get the interaction of the other scientists with him and he's just like but i've got it dudes and they're just like no we're okay, doing this you know, thing even on the timing just because it starts with uh 2099 and then 2115 we don't know where carl fits into that time frame. oh i just saw that good eye sheila that is also true so on the first page we've jumped a number of years 
like 20 years. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, definitely think of that his discoveries, we don't know how they relate to the evolution of science in, in these, these other parts that I mentioned, here, uh, which would be important, obviously. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like this information will be important later on in the story, but we really want to start at that um, hook moment. Yeah. Where and the story kicks off. The character that I think, you know, uh, he, he has to be the hook moment. Yeah. Because the other stuff is just basically, so here's what's happening in the world scientifically. Yeah, we have a lot of authors in the chat saying, you know, kind of avoid those info dumps, but um, for, that's such a temptation because we want to make sure that the the reader knows what's going on and they understand. So how, how do we do that? How do we find that critical moment to start with? Well, I think, story? I think, you know, I think the first thing you have to do is grab the reader. So you're gonna you're gonna establish um, your situation through a character. Obviously, you're gonna want to have some knowledge of where the story is going, but you don't necessarily need to know everything about the kingdom or the society up front because if if you're a good storyteller, it's just gonna come out naturally as you're telling the story. You know, it's because it's the background setting of everything that's going on. So I think I think rushing to try to put all that stuff in the very beginning is a big mistake. Yeah, yeah this definitely feels like a oh wait, reader. I just want to make sure you know that this is the science. This is the understanding. Um, when yeah, like some asteroids coming down, some aliens come to shoot some stuff. Like that's where we need to be starting. And you know, someone could be running in there. You know, but when they did the experiment for the the lagrange point it this wasn't supposed to happen we've deleted two paragraphs yeah with one dialogue so definitely and we're definitely. gonna find out about it at some point if it's actually important to the story so um i think i think the reality is you actually have to credit readers with the ability to pull out information as they're reading it and if they can and obviously they're not giving them the right information but if they're if they're engaged in the story then the flow of it is going to catch them up and, and they're going to get what you're trying to say out of the story. And it's much more enjoyable for the readers to kind of pick up on those clues and to put them together than exactly. to just have them handed to you and like, you know, here's all the information you need to know. Well, for some of the most fun stories are the ones that have, yes. you know, really good red herrings. In them. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. All right. We have one final submission. One. From a very special author. Yes, whose whose um, submission requirements I am fixing so I know where page one is. <laughs> <laughs> he knows who he is. All right, because I'm going to name him Josh Hayes, <laughs> Ghost of Amargo. The nightlife on Amargo 3 was something of a strange thing with all the craziness going on in the galaxy, the wars, the death, the pain. This place seemed to be oblivious of to it all. The clubs were hopping with people from all walks of life. I couldn't help but be drawn to the rhythmic beats and scantily dressed. What are you looking at? Carrie asked, raising an eyebrow. I, nothing. I pulled my eyes from the tall blonde wearing nothing but a sheer piece of cloth around her torso. I swear to God, she winked at me as I looked away. Just looked a little cold in there is all. Uh-huh. Seriously, though, I'm hungry. Are we going to walk around this place all night or find some place to sit down? What are you in the mood for? Carrie asked, glancing around at the rainbow of holo signs and logos flanking either side of the boardwalk. Food, I said, forcing myself not to groan. We've been on the run long enough. She knew I really didn't care wh where we ate, and we've had some downright terrible shit. I couldn't help thinking about the Sarkozia ribs we had a couple months back. Now those were her work of art. My mouth watered just thinking about them. Burgers? I nodded, eyes following her direction to a flickering blue-white holo image of a massive hamburger overflowing with all the trimmings. My stomach growled at the sight. Now that's a burger. Now I just want to say really quick, I really like this opening. We have no idea what the frack is going on, but these characters are super fun. He's a little bit of a perv. She's just like, get you an order. Need to eat people. And I like it. All right, Sheila, go. Okay, well, the lamb. I, I'm like, a, a, 
I think there's a little too much about the food <laughs> and not enough about the characters. It's like, okay, so this is like some kind of little pleasure planet, you know, uh, except that it's obviously not a very good pleasure planet because the place they go into eat has terrible food. Um, and I think it only gets interesting when you get to the very end of it, um, where the one character says, at least your taste buds are working right, Terry said, go missing. And the other character says, yours aren't. It's not that they're not working, they're just not mine. It's a little hard to explain. I remember what things tasted like in my old body, in this new one, well, it's just not the same. I guess I never thought being in a new shell would change that kind of thing. Carrie shrugged, I'm sure I'll get used to it, it'll just take the fun. So that's like, the, that's the that's the meat, and that's the real interesting part. And instead we're like walking along the boardwalk, looking at all these images, and they're going in and getting really crappy food. You know, so I think that could, I, I don't want sure. to know the setting, but I think that could be a whole lot shorter, you know, uh, because really, that's, there's your story right there in those last paragraphs, you know. And that, Mr. Mr. Josh Hayes, was at the end of the second page. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Per, per, per the the requirements of submission, yeah. but um, but yeah, no, I agree. It's it's I like this first page because it's it's a bit more fast paced. We're kind of getting into the swing of a bit of what's happening and a bit of what to expect. But yeah, it probably could be trimmed up a little bit to get to because I didn't read that part down there <laughs> to yeah. get to that that juicy bit. Right, because that's 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 where the whole story is going. You know, so it's, it's like, okay, wait a minute, why are you in this new body? What's you know, what's this world? What's going on here? And uh, you know, and are you in this new body because your old body was destroyed because of something that you guys were involved in? And so, or are you in a new body because your body got old or got sick or something? You know? So, um, but but that's the whole gist of the story: the fact that that. This is a place, this is a world, a universe where you can swap bodies and it's still you in this body without yeah. some differences. Yeah, it yeah, so, is interesting. We also hear that they're on the run and yeah. it, it, clearly they're going from planet to planet on the run. So the reader knows that we're going to see this universe. We're going to see these different planets. We're going to, you know, those Sarkozy ribs sounded really interesting from that other planet. Yeah. Um, so there's going to be different different uh cultures different experiences here and why are they on the run what for what have they done you know are they innocent are they well, they don't seem to be like very seriously on the run because they're like strolling casually and then you know going into the sea or whatever so uh they obviously whoever's pursuing them they don't feel as right up on their on their track at least, so. and and i will add i love this opening paragraph and then that cut off of what are you looking at it's it's i i personally like that it brings in a little bit well, that's very of, human that's very natural yeah, it's, it's, it's just it, fun. It, it, it attests to their relationship with one another. and and being able to do that via the 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 narrative and not and not and see okay this thing it Mm, as an editor i see this so much so rhythmic knees and scantily clad dressed finishing the sentence um carrie interrupted what are you looking at? Like, or you just cut out all that garbly gook and what are you looking at? And it just creates this image of instantaneously. So it's like shortly after that, you know, swear to God, she winked at me, just like, all right, you know, let's go get something to eat. What about burgers? Get to the line she was talking about, we're there. Yeah, exactly. And and, and the, you know, the, what are you looking at? It's like, she obviously knows what he's looking at. She knows it really well. And that's what we get into that opening book. You know, so. Right. I like starting with that moment because we recognize it. We've seen it before. And it's basically a meme, right? Yeah. We've all seen that meme. And he, he's starting out his book with a meme. It's hilarious. I, I love that. I don't, yeah. Maybe Very we can strong. get to, in, uh, yeah, you're right that a few paragraphs down when he gets to the bit about, you know, she's in a new body. You know, that's that's very interesting. We kind of point to that interesting part a little, you know, closer up at the top. But I mm -hmm. like what he's doing here with the world building and bring the reader in with the meme right off the bat. Yeah, you know, you know, that's that's definitely, you know, uh, character review and character relationship review. So uh, that's fine to start with. But, but I definitely think we need to get to that uh, that second page paragraph a lot sooner. So. All right, Josh, with your special submission, because you got it in just under the wire, sneaking in that second page. Did good, sir. Did good. <laughs> All right, Sheila, oh my goodness, thank you so much for coming on, for chatting with us, for 
taking the time to really look, read these first pages and, and give your opinion so that all of our, our authors, our viewers out there, you know, I hope every one of you got at least one thing out of this. It's like, I do that. And it's like, oh, just make it all stronger. Um, again, we know you're from Job Books. Can you please tell our viewers, our listeners, where they can go to perhaps submit something of Tasty Delicacies? Um, it'll actually be on the website. We have a we have an app now called Submittable, and I'm hoping that on the website it actually tells me how to go to that. You know, because um, like I said, our slush readers are the ones who really go into that. We only see stuff if they send something specifically to us. So, um, but it is it is submittable, and it's probably I would assume on the website. You know, um, and if you don't see it on the website, then um, you can you can uh, just email us and, and uh, the person who's kind of in charge of that will be able to tell you how to get on it so all right so definitely check out the dog books website look for the things find that contact info you'll get it submit it <laughs> things could happen and as always happy birthday lauren thank yeah, you yeah make that good. first page really good really good yes definitely <laughs> make it tight Make That's it the birthday present, right? You know, a good first page. <laughs> yes. And, and and with your first pages, you know, what do you want the reader to know? What's the most important thing they need to know? Definitely the main character, what they're about. And the current problem doesn't even have to be the main problem, just their current problem <laughs> and how <laughs> that all fits together. And I guess the other side of that is if you were the reader, mm. what would you want? Look at if you look at your novel that way as a reader, not the writer, yep. that will hopefully uh, help you modify things. What Sheila said, <laughs> write it like a reader would read it, and all the delicious things, all the things. Are we definitely on for Saturday now? I forgot to ask you this before we went live, so I'm asking you live. <laughs> I'm in the process of scheduling. All right. Yeah. So That's we, a definite maybe. All right. So we definitely maybe on the writer's journey are going to be gradually maybe moving our show times to Saturday at six. What did you say? Six? Eight? Eight Eastern? Eight, eight, eight p.m. Eastern. Is that six Eastern. your time? You my time. Six out before you like have posted it for them to link to. I know. I think, I think in my time, and I just know it's two hours ahead for her, oh, so I wanted to make sure right, right. that that was correct. All right. Yeah. So 8 p.m. on Saturdays <laughs> is what we're headed for because it works the best for both of us. We hope that you all will still come and join us for more topics, digging deep on the writer's journey, on the writer's life, so that we can all grow and you know, be better in that thing that we love and that we do. All right, thank you everyone for coming on, joining us. Thank you, Lauren, for spending your birthday with us, yeah, digging up on page things, and we got through them all. Yes, All righty, Roast of Doom. Yes, get your Keystroke Medium coffee at keystrokemedium.com. Lots of delicious coffees up there. Definitely bug Josh to get the whole bean so you can grind that stuff down to your desired texture. And as always, be sure to check us out next week, uh, as well as live Mondays, 11 a.m. Central. Yeah, 11 a.m. Central. All uh, right, reading. <laughs> writing everything in between right here on Keystroke Mediums, The Writer's Journey. Good night, you guys. Good night, Good night. everybody.